spend the rest of the time, so the, the following 25 minutes, just having any questions that we might have and trying to answer them. If we don't get to you uh, in the questions, then don't worry, I'll, I'll give you my email address and you can just uh, uh, drop me a line there and I'll see what I can do to answer it after this talk. Um, so I'm going to share my screen now. And hopefully everybody can see that. Um, so I, uh, I wrote a book about, well, it came out in May 2018, uh, May 2019, rather. Uh, I'm, no, May 2018, goodness, it's been so long, I've totally forgotten. Um, a lot has happened since then, called How to Give Up Plastic. And the reason why I get, wrote this book was because so many people were asking, what can I do? What, uh, you know, I, I understand the problem, I care about the problem, but I don't know what I can do. And that, as a campaigner, and I've worked on environmental issues for, for more than 10 years now, I look a lot younger than that. Uh, <laughs> uh, but that, that as an environmental campaigner was an absolute joy. You know, I've never worked on a campaign like Plastics where that people just care about, people want to do something about it. And, and it's been an amazing journey over the last six, five, six years since we started this campaign to see how big it's grown. And, you know, we definitely have uh, certain famous wildlife presenters to thank for that. Um, but I'm going to start with just sort of plastic, what it is, where it comes from, uh, and, and why we care about it. Uh, but before I do that, I also just want to mention a little bit about, about the, the, the environment in general and, and the state we're in. And apologies, this is the depressing bit before we get on to the hopeful bit later on. Um, but the world's a little bit scary right now, and I, I would think that probably everyone on this call is feeling a little bit of that sort of pressure, that sense that, um, you know, what if it doesn't all work out? What if there's not a sort of fairy tale ending? And, um, and, you know, we look at the news and we see the Amazon burning. We look at the news and sometimes we even see the Arctic burning. Uh, but then we also look at the news and we see that despite the world burning, there are still companies trying to find new places to explore for oil, to turn into plastic. There are still uh, new industries like deep sea mining, trying to find sites on the seabed to dig up for rare earth metals. You know, uh, There are still pesticides companies that are banned across the European Union, but they're exporting their pesticides to other parts of the world where, where they're not banned. You know, the, the world is, is, is a complicated, strange place and, and the environment is changing at a rate even a few years ago, we, we weren't predicting how fast it was going to be. There were two reports that came out in the last two years that I just will very briefly touch on. First, I'm sure everybody saw it, is the IPCC, that's the Inter Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report, <clears throat> that came out and said we had 12 years left. Well, now it's, it's 10 and a half. Uh, uh, but I would say I don't really like that, that framing, that, you know, every every single bit that we halt climate change, that we stop plastic pollution is making the world better. And, and it will be worth fighting right the way through uh, until the very end. And that IPCC report, uh, it, was, it was a scary moment. And it was a bit of a wake up call because it was just saying, we, we have to sort out these problems now. You know, the science is, is there. We understand the science. We actually don't need any more science to understand the impact we're having on the world to know that we need to radically change our behavior and, and the way we're, we're dealing with the environment. But there was another report that came out, which was IPBES for any uh, geeks uh, out there who like acronyms that I'm not even gonna try and remember what the acronym is off the top of my head, but it was in a short, the biodiversity, the wildlife equivalent of the climate report. And what that said was there are a million species facing extinction over the next uh, few decades, a million species. We are living through a mass extinction period at the moment. And I think what, what's scary, and, and I, I spent quite a lot of last year out on the ocean, and I noticed it myself uh, when, when I was sailing between Portsmouth and the Azores investigating the overfishing of sharks, is these two things, wildlife loss from overfishing, from pollution like plastic and all of those things, is, is working together with climate change, and they're brewing up a kind of perfect storm where they're feeding back and, and making each other uh, 
accelerate. Um, so this was something that I saw again firsthand in the Arctic uh, at the start of last year when I was up there on board one of our ships and we were looking at how, you know, the, with the ice melting, the, the waves are getting stronger and they're causing the ice to break up quicker, which in turn is making it melt quicker. So, so you have what's called a feedback loop where uh, problems feed each other. And plastics is one of those problems. Plastics is one of those sort of threats that the ocean is facing, which is multiplied by things like climate change or, or wildlife. Loss. And I promise we're going to get onto the hopeful bit. But before I do, I, I, I think it's really important, and I'm sure there are people on this call who are members of, of environmental groups. We talk about this a lot. I, I know, for example, Extinction Rebellion talk about this a lot. But it's important to remember we have already changed our planet. We have already changed it. There's not some um, halcyon days that we can go back to uh, where the world will be as it once was. And I had a moment, certainly, of, of realizing that myself. And this was a couple of years ago. I was in the Antarctic and I was uh, testing for microplastics. We were testing for plastics in the water, at the surface, and on the seabed. We were testing for plastics in snow. We found microplastics in freshly fallen snow, so it had been rained down into Antarctica. Uh, we found it in 90% of the water samples that we took down there. But there was one moment on that expedition where I really thought, God, we, this, there isn't any going back, uh, which was we, we came across this incredible iceberg. Um, it was, you know, icebergs in Antarctica, I don't know whether anyone on this call is lucky enough to have gone, but they are on a scale that is almost incomprehensible. It's, they're kind of cathedrals, bigger even. And we came across this iceberg that was m maybe 70 to 100 meters high. Um, so that's only one tenth of it, the rest of it is underwater, 70 to 100 meters high, and uh, uh, four or five times the size of our ship. And we stopped because our photographer he wanted to get lovely photos of it from a sunset so we could tell people about this beautiful, strange place that they needed to protect. And as we rounded it in, in one of our little dinghies for him to take photos, there in the water were four enormous neon plastic fishing boards. And I should say, this, is, this wasn't just any bit of Antarctica we were in. We were in the Weddell Sea, which for those that haven't come across it, the Weddell Sea is where Shackleton sunk his ship or had his ship sunk, ship sunk. he didn't do it deliberately. But uh, the Weddell Sea, it's so cold that fish have a natural antifreeze in their blood to be able to survive there. It's one of the most remote places on the planet. I remember going, being in the bridge on our ship one night and uh, looking at the radar and realizing that in this two million square kilometer sea, there was us and one other ship. And if you, know, if you want to feel lonely and remote and far away from help, don't go up to the ship's bridge at night in Antarctica because that really compounds it. And so that we were finding this plastic waste in that situation, it was, it was a wake up call. And I'd worked on plastics for a long time. Like I said, the whole reason we were down there was to find plastic. But I still had that moment of thinking, we cannot clean all of this stuff up, but we can stop the problem from getting worse. And so that's what I wanted to focus on with this uh, talk. So uh, plastic, it started in the 60s, the plastic bag revolutionized shopping. It's still considered a valuable object in some places. I don't know if people know. I, I went to Poland and gave a talk on, on plastics and uh, uh, a woman put up her hand in the audience and said she still washed them out and hangs them on the washing line because before the Iron Curtain fell, they were a sign of how wealthy you were if you had plastic bags at home. And the reason why they got so widespread is, you know, in some ways they're great. They're cheap, they're flexible, they're durable, they're hygienic. Uh, you know, they have all of these amazing qualities. The problem is they're the same qualities that mean that they never go away. They live out there for hundreds of years in the environment and haven't worked out a way of, of uh, efficiently getting rid of them or recycling them. Um, they're also amazing for marketing. Now, you know, now we're at a point in history where we realize that we probably shouldn't be buying so much stuff. But if you want to get people to buy stuff, plastic is a phenomenal tool for doing so because you can print anything on it and you can mass produce it and you can turn it into amazing designs. Uh, you can blend it with other materials like Pringles and come up with an iconic uh, design symbol 
that unfortunately is a, an absolute environmental disaster. Uh, Nespresso pods, again, they're, you know, these, these amazing sort of brands that are all about design and they all rely on some form of plastic. Um, and also the other reason why it's become so widespread is because our world has gotten more complex. We have longer supply chains now. We transport things through many different means right across the world constantly. And, you know, COVID-19 coronavirus, it really laid bare how complex these supply chains are, how much we're dependent on uh, quite vulnerable systems that in turn have become dependent on plastic. So all of these reasons are why plastic has ended up being absolutely everywhere. Um, uh, but why are we caring about it now? That's an that's a interesting question. Why suddenly do we care about this? Why not 10 years ago or 20 years ago? And I'm saying that knowing that there are guaranteed to be some people on this call who cared about it long before it was fashionable. So you're excused. But for the rest of us, why only now? And, you know, I think this is an amazing example of how social media, how, um, how mainstream media works nowadays, that, that you can get memes, you can get iconic images. I'm not going to stay on that image actually for too long um, because it's really grim, but those images of birds' stomachs filled with plastic, they were a real moment. That moment of watching someone pull a, a straw out of a turtle's nose, that was a real moment. You know, uh, David Attenborough explaining how heartbreaking it was to watch an albatross feed its chicks plastic, that was another moment. Um, we care about it because we have seen these things on the screen but most importantly, we then go outside and we see it in our own backyard. We see it in our own parks and we see it in our own rivers, on our own beaches. And, and so it's one of those rare occasions where an environmental problem is so visible and so tangible uh, and, it, and it tugs at the heartstrings. And, um, you know, that's very painful. But like I said at the very start, as an environmental campaigner, as someone trying to change this, there aren't many environmental problems that you have that that real tangible link. And, and it, that's why it's so great campaigning on plastics because you barely need to do any explaining to anyone. This is just a picture of that iceberg that I mentioned. You can see all the penguins at the bottom for a sense of scale. Um, now, uh, and here we were testing for plastic on top of one of the icebergs and taking snow samples. Uh, but so why why has it gotten everywhere? Like, what's the physical process for it getting everywhere? And apologies again for, for people that know this, but plastic is very versatile. It's very durable, and once it gets into the ocean, which it does in a whole range of different ways, ocean currents can take it everywhere, and they take it everywhere because different kinds of plastic float or sink or stay in the midwater level, and then ocean currents can can take it around. So. There's a reason why bottle caps are one of the most found items in the annual Ocean Conservancy beach cleans, and because they float at the top, same with plastic bags. But there is so much more plastic hidden beneath the surface, and this is before we even get to, to microplastics. You know, we have found plastic in the frozen ice in the Arctic. We found it, uh, you know, tied away in, in mangroves, in, in, in swamps. We found it deep in bogs. Uh, and, and we find it all the time out in the open ocean. And, and I put a picture of fishing waste here because, you know, up to a quarter of the plastic in our ocean by weight could be fishing waste. And the thing is, we'll never really know because the ocean is enormous. Uh, it's, it's, you know, it's hard to comprehend uh, how big it is, but so much plastic that is there, we'll, we'll never fully know about. So all of these are just estimates. Um, I think one, one that always gets me is the fact that we found plastic in the deepest trench in the ocean, 11 kilometers, seven miles beneath the surface of the ocean in Challenger Deep, which is the deepest trench uh, as part of the, Mar the deepest part of the Mariana Trench. They found an intact plastic bag. Some of the fish in the Mariana Trench have never seen daylight, and yet they are swimming through our waste. Like I said, microplastics, you know, they are... Uh, uh, another part of plastic that's getting everywhere. So microplastics, they can get into the ocean in multiple ways. A lot of microplastics are uh, parts of bigger plastic that sunlight and waves and rocks have broken down into smaller bits. But a lot of microplastics are, are actually going into the ocean as microplastics and they're coming off of our clothes. 
for example. So uh, up to a third of the plastic in the ocean by weight could be microplastics and up to a third of that could be microfibers coming off of our clothes when we wash them. So that's nylon, um, uh, polyester, you know, synthetic fibers that, that when you stick them in the wash, they shed these microfibers. And they're what we were finding in the snow in, in Antarctica and in the water in Antarctica. These microfibers are very common on outdoor gear. Um, and, you know, why are they a problem? And I'm sure I don't need to explain to people in this call why, why they're a problem. But, but just in case, so microfibers, they're, they're a problem because um, they can get into the food chain. Very, at a very basic level, that's that's the that's the threat they pose. So when a when a plastic is this small, it can be mistaken for food by a small fish, which again can be eaten by a bigger fish, eaten by a bigger fish, and it can work its way up the food chain until something at the top of the food chain actually has a large concentration of plastic in it. And one of the things that's making the problem worse is that plastic, when it's in the ocean, they can act as kind of magnets for toxins. So Toxins, I mean things like mercury or cadmium, you know, naturally occurring toxins in some cases or man-made in others. And so as these plastics attract the toxins, then they get eaten, then they work their way up the food chain. That's a process called bioaccumulation, bioaggregation. And it can actually make, you know, right at the top of the food chain can be incredibly toxic for the animal consuming it. We're seeing very, very high rates of PCBs, they're poly goodness polychlorinated biphenyls uh which were you know used as flame retardants and batteries they were banned in the 70s but they're, they're a chemical compound that lives on in the ocean and they are attaching themselves to plastics working their way up the food chain and when by the time they get to whales or seals for example they can start to have real real negative impacts suppressing the immune system suppressing uh, their ability to reproduce you know in in simple terms sending them mad uh, and you know so much so that actually Inuit women uh, have, uh, are, are not meant to breastfeed their children if they are eating seal blubber because the rates of PCB um, toxicity are so high. So microplastics are, are, are another huge part of the problem and this is where I get onto the hopeful bit but change is happening you know but things are moving fast and I'm sure that everybody on this call is frustrated that they're not moving fast enough but I, I can never shake the optimism. I wouldn't do the job that I do if I wasn't optimistic. And one of the reasons I'm optimistic, like I said, people care about this issue, but also we have seen progress on a pace that I'm not sure I've seen on an environmental problem. And I think it really started with microbeads. So this is 2016, uh, Obama had banned them in the States. We thought, why not ask Theresa May to, to ban them here? Not really expecting anything some reason it just took off you know and the uk government decided this was a way that they could show they were an environmental leader they were going to ban microbeads so you know that was the first bit of legislation but then to suddenly find that not only have we persuaded theresa may and, and michael go but actually the daily mail uh, were coming on side you know not natural allies for greenpeace three front pages there may i'll end the plastic scourge plastic with high terms you know they turned this into their campaign it was quite a phenomenal thing to watch the daily mail pick up an environmental campaign like that and then that led to other people like sky ocean rescue and you know this is all before blue planet then we had blue planet and it went stratospheric i probably don't need to tell the story up to that point um so the pace of change, the rate of change is, is phenomenal. And uh, yes, it's not fast enough. Yes, it's not going exactly as we hoped or, or wished, or maybe not even fast enough to, to deal with the problem, but it is happening. And it's happening because of groups all around the country that are demanding that it happens to your local politicians, to your local councillors, to local businesses, and also at a national scale, putting pressure on the big businesses, on the political leaders. Um, so one example of that uh, is, is supermarkets. So this was our first supermarkets uh, uh, ranking where we wanted to um, put in order the people doing the best and the worst uh, according to plastic. And we did this all, uh, across a range of different metrics. So are they, do they have policies against, uh, uh, to reduce plastic overall? Do they have only recyclable plastic where they do have plastic? No. Uh, do they 
um, uh, have reusables? Are they actively piloting schemes like a deposit return scheme? All of those kinds of questions. What we found were Iceland at the top. Now, this was just after they announced they were going to go single use plastic free by 2023. And Sainsbury's at the bottom. Uh, and that's because they had absolutely no commitments at that time. And then they were also refusing to share data. Now, I wish I had the slide, but it actually, I forgot to bring it across. One year later, we did the same so again, Sainsbury's in fourth. Now that was only because of groups up and down the country going into the shops and putting these stickers on the windows, talking to staff, creating that sense amongst Sainsbury's uh, shop assistants that you know, they didn't want to be a part of yeah. this problem. So that was an amazing example. Another example of, of where we've really made supermarkets change is if you look at Marks and Spencers and uh, the, the, um, the moment where someone very angrily took a picture of a cauliflower steak wrapped in two kinds of plastic and tweeted it out and was outraged by it. And there was such a Twitter storm over it that within 24 hours, Marks and Spencers had delisted the product. Uh, so again, like these kinds of actions by people everywhere are why companies are changing things and we have to keep that momentum up. Um, again on government, this was a, a stunt that we did where we built an enormous plastic bottle. I carried this plastic bottle together with 24 other people across Westminster Bridge, about 40 kilos on each of our shoulders um, for, for a solid half mile. And we dumped outside Michael Goh's uh, ministry, he said, Gove, don't lose your bottle. And you know, this was about a deposit return scheme, another, another example of policy is happening. The environment bill is potentially going to bring in legally binding targets to produce plastic. We are seeing the change start to happen. But there are still many challenges ahead. And um, I will just check the time. Uh, we've got a couple of minutes and then I'll come over to questions. But what are the challenges now? Uh, you know, what are the new avenues that we need to, to start talking about in order to, to, to challenge plastic? And they are cost, health and climate. I think these are the stories about plastic that we need to start investigating plastics impact. So on cost, you know, one of the things that we need to get politicians and, and uh, businesses to, to understand is that in the long term, plastic is going to cost them. Ocean plastic pollution is already costing the world $2.5 trillion a year. Now that is through all kinds of things like uh, tourism impacts. People don't want to go to a beach covered in plastic. That is costing the economy. Uh, or it's through infrastructure damage. So a lot of people don't know the first country to ban plastic bags was Bangladesh in 2002. And the reason they did that was because plastic bags were clogging up the sewage pipes and the drainage pipes, uh, making flooding during monsoon season even worse. So plastics can be a real infrastructure problem. But also, uh, we are trying to make sure that companies that produce plastic have to pay for it in the long term. So uh, that will ultimately increase the cost. So we have to present getting rid of plastic as the, the economic choice, the sensible long-term economic choice. Health, I think this is one that's gonna come up a lot, particularly in the moment where public health is, is so high up the agenda. And, you know, we have, I say we, when I say we, I mean Greenpeace, we've always accepted there will be a certain amount of plastic in our world and medical plastic is one of those areas. Now, we have to find better ways of disposing of that plastic, but there is a reason why, why it's, it's cheap, efficient, durable, hygienic, you know, it's good for a lot of medical purposes. Maybe we could start making it out of seaweed, I don't know, but, um, but medical plastic is one of those ways. But um, for the rest of plastic, is there a health angle there? Is it already damaging our health, the amount of plastic which is entering our bloodstream, entering our, our water? You know, we found plastic in salt, like table salt testing. We found plastic in tap water that we've tested. And then climate. I think this is another big one. And there are two angles to this. One is plastic is made of fossil fuels. So as it decomposes, it releases CO2. It, 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 uh, you know, it will be a part of that problem over the long term. So there is that climate angle, and we know that climate is something that governments around the world take very seriously, not seriously enough, but they do take it more seriously, I think, often than they do plastics. Um, but the other climate angle is the oil companies who are responsible for the climate crisis in the first place 
are also the ones who are investing in plastic factories because they are worried about not being able to sell their oil for energy and heat and cars and emissions because governments have agreed to reduce emissions so dramatically. And so they are actively investing in plastic factories. This is not just over in the States where people like Exxon and Shell are, are very much going down this route. It's as close to home as Scotland with Ineos, who are a fracking company investing in, uh, investing in plastic as where they want to put all of their fossil fuels. So I think the climate angle is another really interesting. So these are just ideas for if you're speaking with councillors, if you're speaking with MPs, if you're speaking with businesses, I think these are three interesting angles that, that go beyond just litter or pollution and actually start talking to, to real long-term sensible decision-making. Um, oh. Now, I thought I had slides on what you can do as an individual, um, but <laughs> they've gone. Um, so I'll just talk to what I had, but there is also a huge amount that you can do as an individual. Uh, so very briefly, and there's plenty more in my book, and there's so much more online, and if you're a part of a plastic-free community, you're going to know a lot of these anyway. But what I always say when someone says, what can I do, is, you know, there are the big four. Um, uh, give up disposable coffee cups. Give up throw away plastic bottles, give up plastic bags and give up straws. Now those four things alone will have a huge dent in your plastic footprint. Not everyone can give up all of them and certainly straws have got plenty of good use for people with, with mobility issues. But those four are a massive part of uh, individual's plastic footprint. So that would be the place to start. But then taking it a step further, I always say to people, start being organized with your shopping, start making a list, start researching where you're buying things. So, you know, just setting in place these new habits. Uh, I think that's, that's one of the things with, with giving up plastic is it's, it's just about forming new habits. Uh, so, so writing down that commitment, writing down what, what your pledge is, what, what you're going to do this week, uh, whatever that might be. Um, you know, as Brits, some research came out last year that said we use 11 billion items of single-use plastic just for food on the go every year. So by taking your lunch into work, by making it on a Sunday and taking back lunch into work, you're going to start bringing that huge figure down. And then in the public sphere, you know, uh, there's, there's amazing things you can do, but I'd say just making sure that whatever you're doing as an individual, you're taking that out into the world and you're letting it be known. So whether that's through conversations with or cafe, whether it's through social media, whether it's in your workplace, and I've got lots more tips in my book on how to run a campaign in your workplace, how to lobby your MP, but the most important thing, the fifth item on that big four list is using that voice, using your, your power as an activist to, to make that change. Um, so I'm going to stop there because I've run over slightly what I was going to do and take any questions. I'll stop sharing my screen as well. Hi, thanks a lot for that. Um, thanks so much for that. That was really, really good. I just, I've, I've just realised that. Um, um, I just realised that there's um, a, a drop down box on Zoom where um, the um, <laughs> there's like a, it says two and it says two all panelists, panelists and attendees. And so people were sort of saying where they were from, but they were only saying it to the panelists, which is me and you. Uh, rather than to everyone else so um yeah so people may have not seen that uh, uh, where everyone else is from um but um yeah so uh, if, anyone, if anyone wants to use the chat box um then obviously uh, you need to click on the drop down box where it says to all panelists and attendees um so that it just it just means that everyone can then see it um or your comments um so that's really good and for anyone who wants to uh, ask well a question, if you, we've got the Q and A box there, so it's got the um, if where it's at the bottom of the screen where it says Q and A, uh, click on that and then uh, you can um, write your question in, in there. Um, and that's going to be the easiest way. Um, so, yeah. So, um, yeah. And I think um, what's really good is um, as well, like what you were saying at the end about. Um, 
terms of individual actions and things. Um, Surface Against Sewage have got this really good um, thing called the Individual Action Plan. And it's just got, um, it's just got kind of some of the kind of things that you were saying on here about some of the um, actions that people can take, such as remember your refillable water bottle, take a, re a reusable co coffee cup and refuse single use takeaway cups, refuse single use packaging, resist a straw, refuse a single use plastic bag and take your own, take your own cutlery or use sustainable alternatives, avoid single use plastics in the bathroom, refuse single use condiment sachets. So those are just sort of some of the, the some of the kind of actions which I think are really good. And obviously um, there's also the point about um, the UK ban on um, plastic straws and and because uh, that was meant, that was meant to be coming in, wasn't it, in April, and it's now been pushed back to October, is it? Yeah, that's right. So um, yes, yeah, so obviously, in terms of sort of like you know, with the with the with the plus, you know, the, the thing about the straws, it's going to be a, obviously it's, that's going to become law from October. So obviously that's going to be um, great for that. So um, yeah. Anyway, we're going to move to questions now. Um, someone said, um, "What advice would you give us? We're just starting plastic-free communities journey in our village." So I think the first thing um, is sitting down and working out. You know just a one month, three month, six month plan. What do you want to do in one month? And that plan for the first month could just be, we want five new members. Maybe it's got nothing to do with plastic. Maybe it's just about, we want five more people to join us on this journey because everything is gonna be a lot easier if you have more people. That's a, the most simple rule to campaigning is if you have more people on your side, you have more of a chance of winning. And so I'd say start with recruitment and then start with something winnable start with something that makes people feel good and that has an immediate impact so maybe that maybe you already know a business uh, in 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 the area that's thinking of giving up single use plastic go to them and plan that announcement um, you know that's what we do all the time we always have a look and say uh, like who's the most likely to agree with us of all of these businesses and let's just have a behind the scenes conversation with them. Start there because there's no better way to launch something than with a good news story. Um, so that would be, I think, if I said two things for if you're starting out, recruitment, get more people involved and plan a really good news story to launch. Definitely, yeah, I totally, totally agree, yeah. And if you're always looking for news stories, like if you search on the internet, you probably find a similar one. So that's what I've done in the past. Looked at like, you know, never reinvent the wheel. If there's, if there's existing news stories out there from other groups, you know, look, look at kind of what they're doing. I always find um, press release templates and things and stuff really, really quite useful. Um, so Kat, um, Kat has said, in terms of individual action, I can't help but feel that individual actions paling to comparison with the impacts of big companies like supermarkets or corporations that make daily products like Unilever have. Could you give us some more detail on how to effectively lobby such consumer companies and how to make that change? Yeah, I, I, you know, you're right in some ways. They, they do pale in comparison and they are a drop in the ocean, but they are absolutely still worth doing because our recycling and our waste system is so bad it's so faulty that that piece of plastic in your hand has every chance of ending up in the ocean. And so that is why individual actions are very much still worth doing. But, um, but it's why I said using your voice, you know, amplifying what you're doing is, is also one of the crucial bits of, of giving up plastic because we do need more people, we need more businesses online. In terms of lobbying the really big companies, you know, I can talk to, to what we do. Try and find the worst examples. Try and find the worst stories. Like, what's the product that makes no sense? What's the product that's made up of five different kinds of plastic and a kind of metal and a kind of cardboard? Um, you know, talk to a, talk to a waste company, uh, a CEO or worker or whoever it is, and get their take on what's the product that they really, you know, they give up when they see them come through the door uh, because they're so impossible to get rid of. Find those bad examples and then kind of build a crime file around them. How many of them are that company making? Uh, and, and then take to social media. 
that's the that's the beauty of it like once you have those kind of investigations doesn't matter who you are you can be greenpeace you can be plastic free chesterfield you can be an individual in their living room if you've got a story and it's a good one then people are going to listen to it and i think that that's one of the best ways of, of lobbying companies now that's if you have a lot of time though. if you have less time then i'd say join a local group um so so Again, go with the strength of numbers. There are plenty of Greenpeace groups out there, lots of plastic-free groups out there, but, but join forces with other people and, and can't campaign together. Okay. Um, Derek's asked, how are reusable cups going to be compatible with the effects of COVID-19 and not sharing utensils? Yeah, so I think there are a few coronavirus questions in there, so maybe I'll, I'll deal with them. Yeah. That, that your, this, you know, we are having to rethink how we campaign on plastic at the moment. I think you're absolutely right. It's, it presents quite a big challenge because the public narrative has gone, you know, hygiene is the most important thing. And for decades, single-use plastic is associated with hygiene. Uh, I think what we, you know, have to remember is that in any supermarket, the single-use plastic will have been touched by innumerable people, innumerable times over many, many hours or days or weeks. So there's no necessary reason why that plastic is going to be any more sanitary than the fresh piece of produce. The same principles apply, washing your hands and washing, washing utensils, washing cutlery. Uh, we just have to, 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 to remember those skills. And I, you know, obviously we all wash up at home, but a lot of people don't realize that it's relatively recent history that we had a very um, large washing and processing industry within the UK. You know, pubs had back rooms where they were, where they were washing. Disposable weren't so common. We just have to remember that this is stuff that we know how to do. And washing with soap gets rid of germs, even COVID-19 ones. So it does present a major challenge. Uh, one of the things that we're doing is trying to get people like the British Medical Journal, uh, British Medical Association rather, and some of those big health uh, bodies to just remind people of exactly that. Yeah, that's great, brilliant. Um, so um, another another question um, has come um, from Claire saying, currently in the political environment, there seems to be many leaders who believe there's nothing to gain from the reductions of plastics or the use of fossil fuels. Would Greenpeace consider joining forces with other environmental organisations? Some on mute. Um, we work really closely with a lot of environmental organizations so uh, we work with you know the, the microbeads campaign was won by a coalition of us the, which was us and uh, uh, marine conservation society flora and fauna international and environmental investigation agency we work with have you got the bottle in scotland you know is really really important that we work together because i i see our market research for anyone who works in in market research or, or advertising i Greenpeace are not everyone's cup of tea. They're a bit like Marmite. It's a, it's a very well-known brand and it provokes very strong reactions. We cannot be the messenger. We are not the appropriate messenger all of the time. So we're often working together in coalition and trying to get our message across. And part, of, you know, part of writing the book was realizing this was a new way of reaching a different, uh, a different audience. In terms of politicians not caring, this, that is, that, that's that's why I sort of touched on with the cost, health, and climate. Because I think those are ways that we can try and get through to some of those other politicians who uh, who aren't necessarily looking at economic impact. They're not necessarily looking at health impact. They're seeing this as a green issue. And sometimes we need to make the case that this is about more than just green issues. This is this is about sensible, pragmatic, long-term decision making. Definitely. Um, Someone else said, what, uh, Jonathan said, what can be done to improve availability of soft plastic recycling? We have no curbside collection for this. So uh, councils, this is one of the most ridiculous things in the UK and it makes me so angry that we don't have any kind of national standard when it comes to recycling. We did some polling a few years ago where 80% of the people that we asked got the symbols on the back of the packets wrong and had no idea what they could recycle in their local area. It's, it's unbelievably 
uh, stupid system that we have. And so all I can say is in your local area, raising that point with local representatives, raising that point with local council, and we are really hoping that the Environment Bill might be a way of addressing this. So if you're lobbying your MP, then the Environment Bill, the only way we're going to achieve proper recycling systems and a proper circular economy, as well as massive reduction overall, is if we start unifying a lot of the recycling systems. Definitely, and, and that that kind of um, there was a similar question in, in the chat as well about how can I persuade my local council to improve recycling, and it could be yeah if, if we can kind of get things a bit more unified in in the environment bill, then then th that might be a, a good way to try and kind of get all the councils to improve their recycling. So, um, someone said, is there a date yet for the plastic bottle scheme? Um, Scotland just said 2022 is when they'll bring theirs in and if I'm completely honest I've forgotten the date for the for the rest of the UK I don't think we have one at the moment I think we're still waiting because everything's been too big yeah and I, th I think I think that again came part of the environment bill as well the deposit scheme so that will kind of come, we'll get more details when when the environment bill goes through but that does seem to be a major part of the environment bill so yeah so we'll look out for that and obviously people can kind of check out what, what you know to try and influence that environment bill as much as possible as it goes through parliament over the next couple of months um someone um lindsay said mass unwraps through the plastic three communities can't be done at the moment do you have any idea how we can get people individually to do this without upsetting the checkout staff um a lot of people are really into it you know it, it's one of those tactics that really resonates with a lot of people and I think in terms of not upsetting the staff, so so I would say this is what a great activity for a plastic free group to advertise in a local area. Um, and we know that companies like Sainsbury's, they do listen to their staff. They're really worried when their staff are unhappy. They're worried. As an aside, a few a few years ago, we had a campaign on boots uh, about krill, selling krill, sort of tiny shrimp-like creatures that live in, in polar regions. They were selling them in, in food supplements. And the thing that made them change their minds over it was the fact that so many of their staff basically got in touch and said, we, feel, we actually feel guilty because these people have a point. So we know that staff, it, staff complaining to their bosses and that getting raised up is probably the single most effective way to make a big company with a, with a high street shop change. Um, in terms of not being friendly, uh, you know, you have to just judge that. And I'd say, be polite, be friendly be nice, uh, uh, let them know. And if, you're, if you feel like it's going badly, if it's escalating and you're not comfortable with it, then just stop and walk away. You know, we all have that power to stop doing something and change our mind halfway through if it's not working out. Um, one thing that I think has been really useful uh, or effective rather uh, in some places is instead of doing it at the checkout, if you're not feeling comfortable to do it there, do it at the customer service desk instead. That's what they're there for, they're paid paid and trained to deal with annoying customers. <laughs> Definitely. Um, so um, Andy has said, um, how can we help our rapid developing countries develop and devise a sustainable and successful waste management program to limit the amount of plastic waste? It's a million dollar question. Uh, well, I think the, the most important thing is that they embed reduction within that because ultimately no waste management system is ever going to be able to deal with a rapid expansion of volume so if you're producing things at an ever increasing rate year on year your waste system is always going to be playing catch up and so the, the only way to to really get developing countries and developed countries to 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 have adequate waste management is to reduce the overall amount of packaging in the first place is that it's the only way yeah. Um, Paul said, living near the Peak District, there's a massive problem with waste from fast food outlets dumped by the roadside, lay, lay by us on any beauty spot. Is there anything being done to make fast food outlets responsible for reducing their waste and encouraging a change in consumer behaviour? So this is something that the end producer responsibility in, in the environment bill would help with. But, but I, you know, shame them. Take a picture of it and send it to the customer service manager or take a picture and, and put it on social media. They they have to start taking responsibility for this. Um, but legally, we are hoping that the Environment Bill will help deal with this through, through what's called the, the, the end producer responsibility. So 
producers being responsible for the plastic at the end of its life, not just at the point that they sell it. Yeah. And is, is that the same? Because we had a question about what can be done to stop, stop discarded cigarette butts. Is that going to be similar as well? You're on mute. <laughs> Sorry, cigarette butts are, are a hard one. I think I'll, I'll be completely honest, this might be one that I have to go away and, and, and talk with our policy people to, to find out what, what, what solutions we're coming up with. Um, because, you know, the obvious answer is uh, people need to stop smoking. <laughs> uh, and as I say that as an ex-smoker. But um, the, yeah, it, cigarette butts, they are so commonly found and they can't be tracked to an individual brand all of the time yeah sure yeah no that'd be really interesting if you can if you can find that out it'd be really useful yeah. to hear back from that um helen said a project's like precious plastic and the boats that are clearing plastic out of the seas and rivers are going to have an impact there yes they will have an impact they will have a localized impact but they are not the solution I think that's the, it's an important distinction to mind. I, I love projects like that because they're amazing for awareness raising. They're amazing for getting people involved and they do have a very local impact. You know, your beach will be cleaner, your river will be cleaner as a result. But the analogy that I think is the best one, that I know lots of people probably have used yourselves when explaining this to family and friends is if you, if you go into a house and the bath is flooding, you, you, you don't reach for the mop to clean up the water, you turn off the tap. and and I think that's the analogy that explains that problem. So yes, cleanup, it's very important. It's a very useful tactic, but it's not a solution. Definitely, and, and I think um, anyone who hasn't seen the story of plastic, um, I'd re really recommend watching that documentary because that does be, uh, talk about the whole story, of the, the whole journey of plastic and about this issue of turning off the tap, which I think is really, really important that we need to not just look at the, the cleanup and look at the kind of the production issue as well. That's really important. Um, so I think we might have time for just maybe one more question. Um, Lucy said, where I live, the council only recycle half the plastic to collect and incinerate the rest in the city with um, acrid smoke which gets into lungs. Why is plastic still being manufactured which is non-recyclable? This needs to change, not sure what is worse, landfall versus incineration, incineration, but we need government to invest money for a better incinerator that can siphon off the gas safely and provide heat. So we, we are opposed to incineration because we think that it's an easy way out. Now that doesn't mean close all the incinerators that are already there, but unfortunately, incineration, it will just allow us to continue to produce at an unsustainable rate. It's a sort of easy way out when actually what we need to do is rethink the, the system as a whole and, and reduce the amount of plastic overall. In terms of recyclable plastic, I'm really hopeful that this is one of the, going to be one of the big wins within the next two years. That we will just see an end to non-recyclable plastic. Unfortunately, we are still seeing a huge amount of recyclable plastic being incinerated as well, though. It's not just non-recyclable that's being incinerated. Wherever recyclable, you know, is just too difficult, or maybe one council has a policy where something's not recyclable, it often ends up getting incinerated. Yeah, sure. Um, so, um, do you, is there time for one more question? Yeah, one more, and then I'm afraid I'm going to have to go and have my Okay. Care. Um, Simon said, um, our home situation um, is very common. We both work full time, stressful jobs, two kids, dependent parents. We do now use the Hello Fresh boxes, but our main plastic use is through generic packaging and convenience foods, as having the time or energy to cook from fresh shop from local markets is difficult. Where do we start when the supermarkets are supplied by few large corporations to a large extent decide how products are packaged? What are the affordable and homemade alternatives? That is, you are who I wrote my book for. Uh, it's for people, you know, and I think there's an element here of being kind to yourself. Don't, you are, you are one person, you have a stressful job, you have, your partner has a stressful job and you have children. You are, you are in the, the demographic of people who is going to find this hardest because convenience is, is so essential in a way. But, so it's about not being afraid to take half measures and, uh, not, be, not, not, not doing something just because you can't do it all of the time. So I say this to friends who have, who, who have young children a lot. It's don't worry if you don't want to use reusable nappies all of the time. Use them when you're at home. You know, don't worry if you just desperately need wet wipes when you're out and about. 
but use a flannel at home, you know, cut, cut by 50%, even if you can't cut by 100%. I think that's, that's one, of the, one of the most effective mind shifts that you need to make uh, if, you're, if you're in that situation. It's like uh, seeing this as a constant journey where bit by bit you'll do a bit more and not giving up on things just because you can't do the whole hog. Definitely. And I know, um, I know the everyday plastic survey has been really good. Um, if anyone who hasn't heard about it, there's, it's been, it's great because it's, um, it, it kind of looked at teaching you how um, you can kind of survey your own plastic use and they provide sort of um, some ideas for how you can kind of reduce your own plastic footprint. And I know that the, the second rounds have started um, last week, but I'm sure I'm sure it's been so popular. I'm sure they'll be running more rounds of it, um, and it's really, really, rec really recommended. I'll put I'll put the link in the in the chat. But I think it, it's a really, really good um, opportunity to sort of utilize sort of yeah, just review your own plastic use and just look at the kind of little swaps and things that you can make. Um, but obviously, um, Will's book, um, How to Give Up Plastic, has got some really good solutions in as well. So do, um, I'll, um, I'll send around uh, the link for the, um, where you can buy the book. Um, obviously, like Amazon's great, but like there are alternatives, there are, um, Amazon's not so great, sorry, but like you can at least, um, there are other alternative bookshops that you can, you can buy from as well. And so, um, I'll send it round um, as well so that you can kind of have a look. Um, but yeah, I just want to say thank you so much to Will for being able to join us today. And it's really great to have you here. So thank, thank you so much. Nice to see you. Nice to see everyone. Thank you very yeah, much. Thanks. Yeah, thanks a lot for, for doing Good it. And, um, yeah, and, and, and anything that you find out as well, um, it would be really good to um, yeah, stay in touch with you as well and I, I guess that people can follow you on social media and you'll kind of be following soon. Yeah. yeah absolutely definitely cool see you so, in a bit yeah brilliant thanks Bye. very much will yeah brilliant stuff thanks a lot <laughs> cheers great